Okay, hello everyone. Let me share my screen. And there it should be. Again, hello everyone. Um, today, happy to see you or, or knowing that you watch my talk. Uh, I will be talking about a project that I maintain, which is called Nuke. And the subtitle for that is the Aegis Build System. Uh, one thing uh, how, I, how I would like to start, and that was actually pretty funny, uh, someone knowing about that this talk will happen uh, approached me before already. And uh, the reason I'm showing you this is uh, he, he said, I'm very excited to give Nuke a spin, even though we don't use C Sharp. And with that, I would also like to leave the question uh, that, uh, well, first of all, I want to say Nuke is not uh, specifically just for, for C-sharp.net. So I know a lot of uh, people who also use it for very different ecosystems. But also this uh, slide is to let you know if uh, if you are in the chat, then you can let me know what uh, particular build system you are using uh, or from which ecosystem uh, you're basically watching. And uh, yeah. And let's continue. I, I also have a subtitle for this and which is called 10 ingredients for an eggless build system. So we will look at probably around 10 ingredients. The first ingredient for this eggless build system is uh, that it's a console application. So naturally, if you've uh, dealt with MS build, for instance, or, or fake and cake, um, those are uh, very special. Uh, some of those use a scripting approach. MS Build uh, is written in, in XML. Uh, but Nuke is different because it uses a simple console application for the build implementation. And that looks like, like this here. So this is, uh, this is a screenshot from, from the Nuke project itself uh, from a while ago. And as you can see, I have my simple solution here. And I have a build project which is marked as not being built. That's just to make it not building itself, basically. Um, but this build project here is basically just a console application. And we all know console application is something that probably everyone can handle. And it's no big deal to, to actually use that. You can see here uh, the only thing that is maybe um, that is maybe new is we have instead of program let's say we have build and we also have a base class but we have our public static and main method which in turn um, delegates to a, to a base method just to execute the build and uh, if you're familiar with other build systems then you know um, a common approach in build automation is that you define your your steps in build targets, so to say. And those targets uh, define dependencies on each other, uh, which then get executed from the underlying build automation system. So uh, speaking of the hello world example, for instance, uh, we would define a target hello, and we would define a target world, which in turn depends on hello. And due to this dependency, um, eventually, if we would execute that, then first we would see a hello and a second target, uh, it would print the world target. But th those two targets currently don't do anything. Uh, also note that uh, here in, in the static and main, you can define the default target, which is executed. So naturally, from the, um, from the command line, you could pass the target that you intend to ex execute. But if you don't execute anything, then world will be uh, the default. One very uh, distinctive characteristic of Nuke is that it uses symbols for the actual target declarations. So um, if you look at, at MS Build, for instance, then targets are uh, stringly, uh, how's it called, typed because um, they are really only strings. And if you rename the target in one place, you really have to make sure that it's renamed in the other place as well. And so if you would rename one of those, and those are actually properties here, uh, just a, with a fancy uh, tail back here, because it's a, a target is a, is a delegate, and those are expression bodied members. Um, but otherwise, from, from down below, uh, what we 
what we are getting is basically just a fluent interface. And the implementation for a target just resides in this execute lambda, which is uh, empty in this case. And uh, yeah, with that, and, and particularly, I forgot that um, you can just set breakpoints like you're used to. That is really important because that's something that not every build system uh, supports nicely. In every uh, IDE that you're using, editor, no matter what, if it supports debugging, you can immediately start uh, start debugging those. The second ingredient is the global tool, which makes it really easy to approach Nuke and also continuously uh, use it. So the first is, uh, and I have that installed on my local machine, of course, but the first thing is you install the new global tool as a global tool. So this is, uh, for those that are not familiar, that is uh, the new way in .NET Core, or nowadays .NET, uh, to install tools that are globally available. And with that, uh, we can actually use a global command, which is called nuke. And here, what you see above here is the help output. So if I type new dash dash help, then this is what gets outputted because here we have a couple of uh, targets that would be like we had before, um, hello and world. And we also have a couple of default par parameters, which are in this case, uh, like graph help, etc. Help, like, like I mentioned, is what this, uh, what will show this dialogue. And down here, and that, that's very interesting as well. Uh, you can already see that Nuke supports some kind of uh, shell completion. And the, uh, let's go through it. So first we type CO, complete to compile, which is a custom defined target. We can skip targets, in this case, clean, for instance, and restore. And we also have a verbosity parameter, which has one value uh, of verbose. Yeah? So verbosity in this case would be an enum actually. And the great thing also here is no matter if, if, you're, if you're adding custom targets, of course, that's and custom parameters, of course, that's the, that's the idea of build automation, then those will also be available from here. So it's not just the conventional ones that are defined, um, that are predefined, but also your own. Um, this is, so to say, the start when, when you're inside a repository with Nuke, then what you do is call Nuke uh, colon setup or just Nuke. That also works because it knows there's no, uh, it, it's not being built with Nuke yet. And afterwards, you get into some kind of uh, setup wizard. So the first thing you do is um, giving your build project a name. Some people prefer dot build instead of underscore build. Uh, you can define where it should be located. Um, you can uh, choose the version. Uh, you can tell it's pretty old, that, that image, because we're currently all, already at 5.1. But anyway, I skipped from 0 0.25, 5 point already. And uh, you can also define to add this project to the solution. What we, what we saw in the very uh, first image, which is usually the default for me, but you can also choose to leave it out from the from the um, solution file. And there's also a more elaborated wizard, uh, but in this case, we will just uh, skip that. And afterwards, uh, after the setup has completed, um, we will find a couple of uh, changes that have been applied. So the first is there will be a nuke file added. Actually, and that's one of the recent versions, that's why I haven't uh, changed it yet, uh, meanwhile, it's a nuke directory. So dot nuke directory will be sitting usually next to your dot git or dot svn folder, uh, uh, depending on what you're using. And uh, before that, dot nuke was referencing that default solution we just picked from the previous step. Uh, meanwhile, there's a parameters JSON which holds holds that reference. Also, we will add uh, the underscore build CS project. We have a default build class implementation. We have two bootstrapping scripts for Windows PowerShell, Unix Bash. Those will make sure that, um, that the .NET SDK is installed on the, on the system that is executing that. So which, which, makes, it, um, which uh, makes sure basically that the build project can, can execute. You might still have certain dependencies, 
but this will make sure that the build project can execute. And we have some uh, some files for for formatting, of course. Target model. So we've already seen this small example with Hello World. Um, let's look at a more elaborated example. In this case, I have a, a compile target, and you can see unit tests and integration tests are depending on compile. I know usually you would draw the arrow in the different way, but I remember this was uh, this was captured with a JavaScript framework. I didn't know how to how to change the uh, change the direction. Um, test in turn is dependent on unit test and integration test. Pack is just depending on compile. And as you can see, we also have a clean here. And let's just look at clean and compile. Uh, that basically means that compile is not dependent on clean, but when those two are executed together, then clean should be scheduled before, right? Because you, you, you don't want a hard dependency, but more of a soft dependency that only gets considered if those two are um, executed in combination. And as you can see, uh, publish, for instance, is in, in eventually depending on compile, but it's also actually uh, depending on clean. So uh, this way, uh, if we execute uh, publish, for instance, then clean will actually get executed. And then the rest, of course, also inspect, which is for inspecting code. And also here you see a, a, a yellow arrow, uh, which I hope it's uh, you can see that. And that is to uh, define a trigger. So this is this is a bit of a um, this is about semantics, basically, because if you had an announced target which um, which posts a message on Twitter, for instance, for a new release, then you don't exactly want to invoke the announced target. That's that doesn't sound doesn't sound great. You want to invoke the published target, which in turn triggers the announced target. There's a bit of semantics here. And also important to note here is um, before we saw this depends on. But Nuke, uh, for all those um, for all those different dependencies, allows to define it either from from the source or from the target. So we could say um, compile depends on restore, but we could also say restore is dependent for compile. Yeah, and this uh, goes through all of these. So for for ordering dependencies, those soft dependencies I mentioned, uh, you can use before and after. Uh, for Triggers, we can use triggers and trigger by. Um, then there are some, some more um, fluent APIs, which is assured after failure. That is something that you probably uh, would do for, for a cleanup target that should be executed at the very end of all your targets. Or announce, for instance, you want to say proceed after failure, which would mean even if announce would still have targets afterwards, then if announce fails, let's say the credentials are not right, then you don't really want to fail the build, but you want to proceed after failure. Also, and this is uh, very uh, uh, depending on the situation, but you can also define conditions, whether a target should be executed, uh, which can be either statically checked, which is um, at the moment the build will start, or dynamically. So. Uh, statically is something you could check, for instance, if you're running on app layer, for instance. Uh, with dynamic, you would check something like, uh, have those files been created already? Because a pre uh, one of the previous targets is supposed to create those files. Um, so you have conditions, and uh, if those conditions are not met, then the target will be skipped. And also for this uh, skip behavior, uh, we sometimes need to define whether the dependencies of a skip target should be skipped or not. That you can do as well. Uh, I uh, for, for, at the very first when I when I was implementing that feature, I didn't I didn't feel like this is necessary. But in the end, yes, there are rare cases, um, but there are cases for that. Okay, the next is CLI tool support. Just give me a second. CI tool support. And that is, um, why is that important? Well, most build systems are depending on, 
on third-party tools, like, for instance, XUnit, OpenCover, Docker, um, what else? You name it. There, there are several of those. Yeah, and and the reason, I, actually, I have this graphic, right? Uh, so .NET CLI, uh, GitHub, DocFX, Coverlet, uh, Git version, if you use that for semantic version, Pucket, uh, anything, yeah? And it is important for a build system to provide, a, at least in my opinion, to pr provide a good way to use those tools. And I will give an example how this is done in Nuke with the Fluent API. So let's say we want to invoke .NET build, build as a command, yeah? Then we can type dnb for .NET build. That will complete to a method. And just in case you're wondering, this is, uh, this is statically imported, so with a, with a, um, a static using, I mean, uh, so that we can skip the, uh, the, the class name and just use the method. That's usually the approach I'm using. Afterwards, we can use uh, Lambda to further define what parameters should be passed. So for instance, in this case with .NET build, we can, could say set project file and we pass the solution, which is also an object. We can continue and say uh, for, for a Boolean parameter, for instance, with, uh, with no restore, we could say it should be enabled, we could say it should be disabled, uh, and we can also set it. So with set, you actually have a, a Boolean argument that you pass if it's depending on something uh, else. And we can also toggle. And why do we have this set of, of manipulation APIs? Well, it's the builder API that is, that is used for that. Um, the builder API allows to make changes, revert th those changes, add more parameters, etc. And you can also, uh, those objects that are uh, created which, with each of those calls, uh, you can reuse them. So every time they will create a new object, actually, and you could reuse them because you might want to invoke .NET build one time with, uh, let's say, runtime X and uh, another time with runtime Y, right? So we can enable no, no restore. For, for Vibosity, because it's it has a close set of arguments that we can pass, you can actually see that we see this set. So it's uh, not possible that we by accident pass the wrong one because I, I can't count how many times I've, pa I've uh, passed, uh, what was it, uh, verbose instead of detailed or diagnostics, for instance. Yeah. And yeah, and then we have our call. And also important, if you go to one of those methods, you can invoke the help. And what you see here is actually the help from the uh, from the official documentation. In this case, uh, MS Build. I think I forgot to mention it here for the for the general call. We have that too, so you can see what .NET Build is actually doing, and that helps. Well, if you're flying around ever again then uh, this helps to actually know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, those Fluent APIs are not written uh, manually, but they use some kind of specification where I gather the metadata about arguments. So for instance, project file is a string. Uh, it will be passed with just the value. Here's the uh, help text. Uh, configuration is similar, but it gets rendered on the... Uh, for the process invocation with dash dash configuration and then value. No restore is a Boolean, right? And it gets rendered as dash dash no dash restore, both uh, with the help text. And that that specification supports a variety, a variety of, um, of different types like, um, like dictionaries, lists, uh, lookup tables, etc. cetera. Uh, one more specific case here is composition. Because this Fluent API makes it really easy to compose your uh, calls based on other conditions. So let's say you want to uh, uh, .NET test, and only when published test results is true, so in this case, this is a Boolean, then you want to set the logger and want to set the results directory, yeah? something like that. And you can do this very, uh, very conveniently. Another example for composition is here for .NET uh, NuGet push. So in this case, I'm pushing all my packages. First, what I'm doing is set the source, 
set the symbol source and API key. And now I want to pass all my NuGet packages, right? Let's say I have five NuGet packages. Uh, what that means is that I have to use five invocations of .NET NuGet push. What I do for that is because the first are common parameters, <clears throat> but then I just use combine with pass the collection of packages that should be that should be published. And then I know this is a bit fancy and meanwhile, I also use different naming, um, but we can use the V, which stands for for variable or for, for value, I mean. Uh, and and this is this gets iterated basically over the uh, collection and uh, will set the target path. And in the end, what this call is doing is invoking .NET NuGet push five times, let's say, if we have five packages. Um, you, could, you can define the degree of parallelism and also if, uh, if it should complete on failure or on the first failure, it should stop. This is how it looks, by the way, in, in something like bit, bit rise, I think that was, was it. So you see here are the invocations and then we have the output. And, and uh, this is mixed because we, uh, we allow the degree of parallelism and yes, exactly. There's also a more lightweight approach. Uh, so let's say if you don't want to use those tasks because yeah, for, for Git, I don't know, I would probably not use uh, uh, this Fluent API because it's a bit uh, too much. Um, but you can actually resolve a couple of other tools in different ways, like loading a, a local executable, uh, lo loading an executable from, from a NuGet package, and the way how you use it is like here uh, with string interpolation. So those fields, this Git field, for instance, and again, this is a delegate, tool is a delegate. Uh, we can use uh, like this. We can pass the argument with a, in a string interpolation way. You can also add more arguments like working directory uh, and, and timeout, environment variables, et cetera. And for all those tools, usually what you want to do is to define uh, the version. And that you do in the CS project file. What I recommend is to use the package download, which is a new since .NET Core 3. something. And that will that is different to package reference because it will only make sure that this particular package is downloaded, okay, in this particular version. Next thing, uh, next ingredient, path handling. Uh, and here, a little bit of motivation. Um, if we use paths in, in our build automation, then often what, what happens is that the path is incorrectly uh, formatted. Like, for instance, some tools can't deal with, um, with relative paths or you're suddenly in, a, in the wrong working directory or something. Uh, maybe they even mix the slash and backslash. And Nuke abstracts that and helps with a bit of division operator magic. So what we do is to have a special type which is called absolute path. And root directory is one of the predefined uh, properties from the base class. And then we can just use the division operator to kind of mimic that there is a SRC sub subdirectory, right? And this will correctly get rendered on whether you're on Windows or Unix and uh, when it's converted to a string. Um, the great thing is we can actually nest that. So output directory is reused here. Uh, you could also use multiple uh, slashes here. We can also uh, calculate relative paths or intentionally uh, create Unix and Windows relative paths. And from those absolute paths, we can also use uh, something like uh, globbing. Like in this case, we can find all the markdown files uh, from down below root directory, for instance. Parameters and auto injection is really great because um, usually in build automation, you also want to you want to add some some input values from the outside to your build. Like for instance, here we have a couple of fields so those are all fields here and we attribute them with the parameter attribute and here on the right hand side you can see what i'm passing on the command line to actually um, give those parameters a value right 
So uh, string, very simple array. I could also use quotes to, uh, I mean, those are three strings in this case, but I could use quotes for that. I could define as a custom separator as well. Um, I can use a switch. Um, also could pass true or false afterwards if I like to. Uh, configuration, absolute path. And in this case, you can see I'm, I'm passing a local path relatively, basically. But this gets eventually resolved to an absolute path. Okay. And here down below, you can see how those values are printed. Hello, ABC, true. Uh, that's basically what happens if I pass those parameters. Also, we have those three for solution, Git repository, and Git version. Uh, that is the auto injection part because uh, those attributes here do some fancy job basically behind the scenes and will uh, will inject an, a solution object, an object for a Git repository to find out about the current branch, uh, current commit, etc. And for a Git version as well, so that we can see the uh, current version that is generated. And solution, Git repository, Git version, you can also see down, down here. Of course, sometimes you also want to always pass the same set of values. And that, that's a pretty new feature, actually. Um, inside the build project, we have uh, a couple of parameters.json files. The normal parameters.json file, uh, you can see here on the right, those are a handful of values that should always be passed. So this is just to, uh, to, to separate data from my build implementation, basically, not to uh, having to search through all my uh, fields that I have there. Uh, but I can conveniently uh, define them in the parameters.json. And you can also load parameters JSONs on demand, like for dev or production use, uh, and have overriding parameters in there, for instance, uh, or other parameters, depending on your use case. And uh, you, that's funny because there's also a schema generated, which allows you to conveniently uh, add those parameters because you have uh, auto completion for that. One great, uh, one, another, one other great thing about those parameters is that you can use them as requirements. So for instance, with the publish target, I do want to check, I don't want to execute compile tests, et cetera, just to find that I haven't supplied the API key or stack webhook or et cetera. But this requires method here will actually make sure at the beginning of the build that this condition is met. Like, for instance, publish also requires that the con uh, configuration is released. And again, this is just repetition. Uh, you can see how the new parameters are added here. Solution model. <clears throat> That's also very interesting. Uh, one of the recent additions, which use a couple, a uh, bit of source generator magic. So we have, we've already seen the solution attribute and, and type. And if I add this generate projects here with true, then you can see with this uh, solution, I can actually have a typed access to my build projects. So uh, before from, from, the, uh, from the solution view, you might have seen that there's a nuke.global tool project and a nuke.ms build task project. And here I have typed access actually to those. What I also have is through those projects, I can get the target frameworks, for instance. Sometimes you have multiple. Same goes for runtime identifiers. And then I can create a couple of publish configurations through that. So basically permutated, more or less, or combined. And then finally, I do my combine with call again to uh, call .NET publish for all those different combinations. Another example, I will make this quick. Uh, from multiple solutions, you can create one global solution, which is very convenient if, if those solutions are in different repositories, let's say, to have one entry point to, uh, to manipulate and refactor all of them. So I'm using this, uh, uh, this uh, in several places, actually, which is really convenient. CI support. That's probably my, my most favorite topic. Uh, the first and very simple thing on your CI server, like in this case, GitHub Actions, uh, Nuke will collapse uh, the targets. Yeah, very easy just to have it uh, more 
have a better view on things. The second more interesting thing is configuration generation. <clears throat> because for AppVayer, for instance, you might know there's an AppVayer YAML file. And many others also have this YAML file or something different, Groovy or, or Kotlin. And with this attribute, what Nuke does is to generate this YAML file for you in a, in a very strongly connected way. Because if you rename the test target or pack target, for instance, because this will invoke the targets test and pack, uh, then this will also reflect in the generated YAML file. Yeah? So you won't run out of date. Uh, you might forget to regenerate those. Um, but it's very easy to generate those files. And in this particular example, you can see we have two images on which it will run. And it's, it's just invoking the build.ps1 file. Very easy. OK, you could say that's not worth the effort. <clears throat> but I will give you a couple more examples. Um, if I, for instance, add a target, say I want to, uh, this target produces NuGet packages, for instance. Then there will be some more generated. And then in, in the FAA uh, um, UI, we will actually see that my, uh, our NuGet packages have been generated and published as artifacts. Yeah? Um, mo absolutely, most favorite topic for me is um, test execution and stuff like that. So let's say you have a lot of tests and they take quite a while, um, then this is something for you, the next thing. Because for a test target, let's say, we have the ability to call partition. And with this number that we define here, we define on how many agents our tests should be distributed. Right. So from the solution, we're getting all our tests. And from with the current partition, and the partition is different on uh, can be different on uh, various agents, but all agents will execute tests, but the first agent will execute the first partition, the second, the second, etc. And then we get the relevant projects basically <clears throat> and just call our .NET test. Locally, by the way, uh, partition is always one of one, so you will get uh, you will execute all of them basically. And this is how it looks. Uh, so here for Team City, for instance, I also have a partition of two, and you can see first partition is executing uh, 240, the second just one. Okay, this is not very impressive. I I agree. Um, it looks a bit different with this uh, artificial solution that I tried that on. Because here you can see the first run was with, and it's seven, 17,000. Meanwhile, I made it a bit less artificial, more, uh, more, uh, more real world like. Uh, but you can see that the first iteration took uh, almost 13 minutes. Uh, after I increased to 10 agents, it went down to five minutes. Uh, with a with a warm start, it went even down to almost three minutes. And this picture is, is a bit older, but what I did in the meantime is also um, uh, improving on that. So for instance, oh, that was too fast. But here with the first, this is actually the naive approach of separating projects, right? Of distributing them. The second one, the green one, is in a way where uh, Nuke will try to find the test results of the previous run, accumulate the test uh, the test duration execution duration, and then optimize how the test projects are distributed. So you can see uh, the it, it's a bit more uh, yeah it's it, it's better distributed and hence the longest response time for for an agent uh, decreased as well. So this is a very, very interesting topic for me. Next is IDE extensions. Um, for that, all, we, have, we, have, um, we have extensions for all the major players, basically, Visual Studio, ReSharper, uh, JetBrains Rider, and uh, VS Code. And this particular snippet to write a target, uh, all of them basically have, yeah. Because I do agree, this uh, this at the this tail here is not exactly. I mean, I, I barely don't notice it anymore. Uh, but I wouldn't want to write it. I'm being completely honest. 
Um, but you can just name your target and then you're inside the executes uh, body. In VS Code, it looks like that. Uh, so that you can run a target, debug a target, and you also have those code lens uh, um, items or, or yeah, items above the target. In Visual Studio, it will look like this here. Um, you have a task runner explorer, have the list of targets, and then you can have two buttons to attach to build process and uh, skip uh, dependencies. And finally, my, my preferred IDE uh, in Rider, it's integrated in the Alt Enter menu. And then inside the target, you can hit Alt Enter or use that little icon here and then choose to execute. That's when you hit Enter on this uh, top level I item. Or you can debug it or run debug without dependencies, which is important for troubleshooting. Right. Uh, so if, if I'm writing a target, I don't always want to repeat the same target over and over again, uh, but I want to run just without dependencies. And this, yeah, I still have this there. Uh, this was a very cool moment to actually see uh, that uh, this shows up on my MacBook. I don't know. I should, I should remove that. No, it's not fancy anymore. Um, here I have another example uh, about the IDE integration and the GIF will restart in a moment. You see, uh, we have again our, um, our call. From here I can, throughout enter menu, I can add a parameter. When I pass the setup API key and I pass it as a string, it will show it's an unencrypted secret because we know set API key is a secret. And I can extract to a field which is attributed with parameter and secret. Okay, that, that was a bit fast, but I hope it's it's uh, understandable. So first, again, marking just a random field as parameter. Here, passing an unencrypted secret, which is shown as a as a uh, as an error in this case. You could also make it a warning, and then I have a quick fix to actually extract the secret for that. Just to make you aware and not let you accidentally run into a situation that you commit a, a secret, which is not great. Uh, this is a bit of work in progress, a life diagram of the dependencies. Uh, yeah, I, I still haven't released that, uh, but yeah, it's work in progress. Build sharing. I should hurry probably. Um, build sharing is necessary every time we. Well, if you have multiple projects, then surely the build automation for project A and B might have some overlap, right? You don't want to implement because you have some certain way to approach things and you don't want to implement it or co copy paste it everywhere. So there are a couple of strategies for build automation, uh, for build sharing. The first obvious one is Git sub modules or SVN has, well, what is it? External, external files or something, I don't know. Uh, then we have NuGet packages because this is just C sharp, so I could use base classes, of course, and publish as NuGet packages. NuGet also has something called external files, which is, which is basically just giving a reference and URL to a file that gets downloaded before the build project is executed, which is also a lightweight approach. A global tool. So that works similar to the new global tool because it you can implement your build. You can make it available as a global tool and then just call that tool and give it to your uh, sub teams or something. They, they are not, they can't longer uh, change the global tool in the way it's built, but they have it very conveniently as a NuGet package. And the most interesting one is interface default members. I will look just at that probably. I, I actually have slides for all three of them for the last ones, but let's, let's just look at interface default members. Because they allow to kind of compose your build out of building blocks, basically. So let's say we have an interface which is published uh, to NuGet, which in in itself depends on I build, and I define two targets for that. I can actually give an implementation, but for the sake of you know conciseness, I will skip that here. I have pack and publish, and then I have a very mm, decoupled interface, which is called I announce, um, and that will add a dependency to I publish NuGet only when the final build uh, class implements that. So I can, 
can loosely couple those. Uh, if I would inherit I announce just like that, then I would just have the announce target with the logger info message, etc. But if I also implement that I publish NuGet interface, then those will define the dependencies between each other. And that looks like if I use a bit of magic and inherit, uh, I have my build class, uh, the base, base new build class. I inherit both of these interfaces. And uh, I just define here in this case the message, for instance, and I define the output directory. Okay. And for clean, you can also see uh, it will, uh, I can define it before I build. Actually, when the interface only defines one target, then you can omit this last part here about the target because then it will know only one target, this particular target is meant. And yeah, that's about it. I think I do have more slides for global tools and external files, but uh, I will skip those just to leave a bit of time also for, for questions. I have one more, uh, the 11th ingredient, uh, which is also a bit of work in progress, which are notifications. And those can be really helpful uh, in a lot of cases, but I will just show it to you. This is how uh, notifications look like in, in Slack. Just a moment, the, the GIF will, will restart in a moment. And this is something that automatically happens once you commit to your, uh, to your repository. The build will start and Nuke has different hooks to show you what commits are relevant for that new build, uh, how the targets are performing, if they're succeeding or failing. You have all the various links to go to AppVaya, GitHub, Azure pipelines, etc. Um, it even finds out who was the committer through the Slack API and then can tag that particular person. Also, you can see down here it has an ETA that is from the previous executions. It knows how long it uh, it will probably take. So that, that's why we can give uh, ETAs. And uh, yeah, a couple of more uh, things. Okay, that was it. From my side, um, thanks for for uh, watching. Down there below, you can see a couple of links. Uh, I would be I would appreciate if you give it a uh, if you give it a star, if you follow on on Twitter or visit the website. And yeah, thanks again for watching. And now you can ask me anything you want. I will keep a keep an eye on the chat and. QA and see what happens. Okay, no questions. Just C sharp gang, <laughs> someone said. Okay, and anyway, um Again, thanks for watching. I hope this was uh, this was uh, helpful to someone. Um, I hope also in in regards if you're um, if you are uh, usually in some other ecosystem, those are there. There are concepts there that are pre that I that I think could be applied to other ecosystems as well. Particularly the specification file, which is cool because it's uh, it's language independent. And 
you could write a generator, for instance, to have similar task uh, as a nuke, but in, in another language, let's say. Okay. But yeah, thanks again. Uh, and with that, I will just end the session and I wish you all uh, a happy or, or a good, good uh, ongoing conference or the rest of the sessions and have fun and hopefully see you another time. Bye-bye.